Main character is a writer in a Stephen King story cliche. Why is this a sin? This is a trademark of Stephen King's work, similar to your trademarks of saying cliche and, you know, being stupid. Our people in Denver recommended Jack very highly, and for once, I agree with them. Okay, what the f*** is up with the people in Denver? Who recommended Jack and why? What's Stewart's beef with the Denver people on their previous recommendations? Is there a specific pipeline of referrals for a f***ing winter caretaker? This information is given to you when James Bond here explains that all the applicants that come here for this job are turned off by the revelation that there were murders committed at the hotel. Also, on what is Stuart making this positive assumption? Mother just met Jack a couple minutes ago. Sure, he didn't make a bad first impression, but it's not like he's lit the room on fire with his personality so far. You mean to tell me that you've never heard people say, I've got a good feeling about you? Oh, wait, never mind. Well, obviously, I mean, some people can be put off by the idea of staying alone in a place where something like that actually happened. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. I feel like the only real direction Stanley Kubrick gave Jack Nicholson in this movie was to be consistently 40% extra Jackie. And that's precisely why this movie is one of the all-time greats, specifically because of Jack Nicholson being all Jackie. You think Batman 1989 was great because of Keaton? And then he had a... <laughs> Lights out. Now you want to get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. There are three Kool-Aid containers here, and not just the individual packets, the full-size suckers. And that is entirely too much Kool-Aid for any group of people that's not a cult. Jeremy just called Eidos a cult, and I feel personally attacked. You can never have too much Kool-Aid, or too much sugar. I don't think you have anything to worry about. I'm quite sure there's nothing physically wrong with Danny. After all, I examined him with rudimentary utensils while he was lying in his own bed, so I should know this for certain. Well, that's what rudimentary means. Basic or fundamental. She says that there is nothing physically wrong with Danny. This much can be determined with rudimentary utensils. Also, who the f*** is this lady anyway? Did Wendy seriously manage to get a doctor to make an immediate house call rather than taking him to a hospital? Or at least one of those minute clinics? What? House call doctors are still a thing in 2019. Besides, don't you think taking Danny to a hospital for visions or having an imaginary friend is f***ing overkill? Dude, even for the 80s, this is massively unsafe. Did Volkswagen seriously not have rear seatbelts? That really isn't the issue. The thing is, seatbelt usage wasn't mandatory practice until 1984, and that was only in the state of New York. As this film is set in 1980, it would be commonplace to see people in the backseat doing what Danny is doing, especially in Colorado, where that law wasn't passed until 1987. Don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. You can look at Jack Nicholson's performance here in a couple ways. You might say he's sort of already done with his family and he's <clears throat> shining them on to affect normalcy. So his playfulness is kind of an act. But very early in the movie, it looks like he doesn't even need a stay at the Overlook to become crazy. That's really what the movie is trying to say, that Jack is already borderline insane. And this is why the hotel was able to possess him relatively easily. This place is fantastic, isn't it, hon? Okay, the weird changing accents in this movie have always bothered me. Where the f*** does Wendy's southern southern twang come from? Did she think she was still filming Robert Altman's Nashville? Shelley Duvall is from Texas. That's where her accent comes from. In the past, when a woman got married to a man, she followed him. So Wendy could be from the south and married a man from the east coast. Okay, so these ghost girls are twins. But earlier, the general manager, Mr. Ullman, said this. He came up here with his wife and two little girls, I think about eight and ten. These girls are supposedly two years apart, but clearly f twins. The fandom refers to the Grady twins as twins, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are, in fact, twins, because they aren't. Brothers and sisters usually look very similar, and their parents might dress them the same, but that doesn't make them twins. Hell, my mother did this to my brother and I, and if my brother were as tall as me, you might even call us twins. The walls are 13 feet high, and the hedge is about as old as the hotel itself. Got a question. Where the f*** was this hedge maze when the movie was giving us this overlook establishing shot? I know this shot is the front of the place, but the camera shows us quite a bit of the back as well. And there is definitely no hedge maze back there. This is a legitimate sin of this film, and that deserves a sin off. 
Way to go, CinemaSins. Gold ballroom. We can accommodate up to 300 people here very comfortably. Besides setting us up for the bar scenes later on, what's the point of this stop on the tour? Hell, Stuart said earlier that there's not a whole lot of time, so why isn't he extremely focused on the essential parts of the hotel? I guess we need to know that this is the gold ballroom, but did they? It's a tour. You'd think that if you're given a tour, you might want to explain the giant shiny room that newcomers would be sure to want to see, right? I think it'd be a good idea if you could show Mrs. Torrance the kitchen while I continue on with Jack. I don't care if it was 1980 and this wasn't technically considered sexist. Why would you not show the f***ing kitchen to Jack? Even if he's not the primary cook of the family, he would be using it at some point, right? You just said that they didn't have a lot of time on this tour, so splitting them up seems like a great idea. And let's be honest here. What traditional man spent any length of time in the kitchen. We got 12 turkeys, about 40 chickens. Why'd they stock the ever-living out of this freezer before they left for the season? That is gonna be sitting there for over six months before it gets served to anyone in the hotel, and freezer burned poultry is definitely a sin. I think when you were writing this sin, you didn't have time to look up what freezer burn actually is. Freezer burn doesn't occur when food is simply frozen. It happens when that food isn't properly wrapped in airtight packaging. Besides, frozen meat can last far longer than six months, with chicken lasting up to a year. We call them docs sometimes, you know, like in the Bugs Bunny cartoons. But how did you know that? Why does Wendy assume that Dick knows that they call Danny Doc? Why can't that just be a thing he calls kids? Because Dick randomly calls their son something they call him at home. I mean, wouldn't you find it a little weird if someone called you a baka outside of these videos? My grandmother and I could hold conversations entirely without ever opening our mouths. She called it shiny. Our other folks, though mostly, they don't know it or don't believe it. Man, if Dick knows more people out there who can shine, there have to be so many who can do this. Just because a handful of people who can do it decide not to believe it doesn't mean that it could be kept a secret. There's like a network of Charles Xavier's out there. You seriously just erected a straw man argument and attacked it here. When the hell did Dick say that The Shining is a secret? You just made that up. A lot of this eventual cabin fever could have been solved by taking a trip into town during one of these nice days. Once they've done their daily duties, can they not pop out to the local farmer's market at the bottom of the mountain or something? If you were paying attention, you'd have heard Stuart say that the road that leads to and from the Overlook is 25 miles long. That's not just popping out to the local farmer's market. That's a 45 minute trip through possible snowy conditions. This is why the Overlook is so self-contained, precisely to avoid having to travel that road. If all Jack's writing is the same sentence over and over again, why is he doing f***ing research? It's not like any of the history informs his descent into madness directly. He's essentially subject to the whims of the hotel itself. Jack probably doesn't realize that he's descending into madness and earnestly gave himself a shot at completing his story. Usually when someone is crazy, they don't themselves realize this. I mean, if you're waiting for a thumbs up, I gotta say, the turtleneck does suit you, man. Jeremy sends something he likes cliché. Danny is roughly seven years old, and no one questions the Torrances for stowing him away with no education for an entire school year? It's not like Wendy's working with him on math or science or sh**. Are they considering this as gap year? Danny is actually five years old, and kindergarten isn't compulsory education. Come and play with us, Danny. Peer pressure. Sinning iconic scenes with lame jokes ex machina. Do you feel bad? No. Oh. So tired. Seriously, this hotel has been open since 1909, and I assume they've had a winter caretaker most, if not all, the years since then. And all those motherfuckers were perfectly fine except Grady and now Jack? What is it about the hotel? Because the movie's definitely blaming the hotel that makes them specifically want to kill their family. It does make it scarier that there's no clear purpose for the eventual horror, but it also cheats out on a reasonable explanation. Considering there are literal ghosts at the end of this film, it's easily understood by us normal people that Jack Torrance is being possessed. If you weren't making straw man arguments while Dick was explaining the hotel, you'd have heard him state that the bad things that happened here leave a mark and that mark can have an effect on people. Look, it is kind of crazy how the carpet pattern changes here, where the tennis ball goes down a clear path of black, but when it cuts to the next shot, the carpet pattern has changed. And it's clearly different when the camera angle comes back to this original shot. This does seem deliberate, because you'd have to turn Danny around on purpose to f*** this up. But how am I supposed to know? I mean, if Kubrick did this on purpose, then what is a channel like CinemaSin supposed to do? Not mention it? I mean, f Oh, just looked at the axe I sharpened today and nearly chopped the whole channel down. This movie isn't f***ing with us, is it? Did Stanley Kubrick know this channel would exist? He did, didn't he? Here's Jerry! All this bullshit. Well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you and Danny. Cut you up in little pieces. Man, I know the marriage counselor said to share your feelings, but I feel like this could stunt your progress. Everything wrong with The Shining, ladies and gentlemen. Jeremy's just watching the movie. Best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Jesus Christ, this dialogue is so similar to the overdramatic garrulousness that a writer would display at a real bar while downing a bottle of bourbon. So the sin isn't really for the movie, it's for how writers behave at bars. Everything wrong with The Shining, ladies and gentlemen. 
The movie is accurate. I've been hurt him once, okay? It was three goddamn years ago! Wendy told the doctor that because Jack was drunk when he hurt Danny, he vowed never to take a drink again, which was five months ago. His sobriety is tied to the incident where he hurt Danny. I grant she might have been lying to the house doctor, but if you're gonna lie, why not make Jack's sobriety three years rather than only five months? And sure, maybe it took him more than two years to get sober, but if he's only had one incident that made him reconsider drinking, what was his motivation to finally get sober five months ago? I would say that I'm surprised that a YouTube channel about movies completely misunderstood understands a movie, but at this point, <laughs> no. Anyway, put it this way. You have two people telling you different stories about the same incident. One is a well-adjusted human being that has the child with them at all times, and the other is an alcoholic that eventually descends into madness attempting to kill those other two people. Which one of them do you think has the actual story correct here? I mean, for Jack, five months without alcohol could feel like three years ago, right? Miami continues to swelter in a record winter heat wave. The central and Rocky Mountain states are buried in snow. Convenient local Miami newscast is talking about f***ing snow in other states as their top story, so the dick will get concerned about the Torrances. Dude, if you would simply listen to the movie, it would explain why this is a top story on the news. The airports have been shut down, and three people have been killed due to the weather. Denver is an important city in the United States, meaning this information would be relevant for travelers. And yes, that means people in Miami too. This is a time before the ubiquity of the internet. The f*** is the hotel trying to do to Jack? At some points, it's appealing to his basic desires, like boozing and sloth and horniness. Then it eventually cuts to the old lady corpse, so it's also just f***ing with it. And what does the latter have to do with convincing him to kill his family? What does terrorizing Jack have to do with convincing him to kill his family? I'm going to answer this with a Simpsons clip. No TV and no beer make Homer something something. Go crazy? Don't mind if I do! Why is Jack allowed to leave after a devilish bait and switch? But Danny got strangled when he walked in this room. In fact, how did Danny even escape if the woman was so strong? The ghosts of the Overlook feed on people with the shine. Her grabbing his neck is how they accomplished this goal, and Danny got away because he's a powerful psychic. In the trailer for Dr. Sleep, they show that using their hands is how the ghosts feed. Dick picked up Danny's shine, right? So why can't he ask him what's up at the hotel via that communication? I guess there could be a proximity aspect to the power, but the movie doesn't give a f about giving any real context to that sh It's quite obvious that Dick isn't as powerful as Danny, and that Danny doesn't yet have full control over his powers. No choice to you, Mr. Torrance. Remember about 18 minutes ago when Jack was here and he had nothing in his wallet? After that, Wendy told him about the crazy woman. Then he went to room 237 and saw the woman with the nice beef. Then he went back to tell Wendy he saw nothing and now he's back at the bar with money in his wallet. Where do you have time to get money? And yes, this could all be in his head, but why would he imagine no money one time and then magically money the next? If it isn't apparent by now, Jeremy has clearly answered his own question, but is still going to send the movie anyway. This question has the same answer as the question about there being no people in the background in one scene and then a full party going on in another. There is clearly something supernatural going on. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here. Jack accuses Grady three times of being the caretaker who killed his family, and he denies it three times like a ghost Peter. And that's fine. It's creepy that a ghost or a figment of Jack's imagination feels the need to lie. But then four minutes later he says, And when my wife tried to prevent me from doing my duty, I corrected her. Basically contradicting everything he tried so hard to deny earlier. That's the point of the f***ing scene. Grady is testing Jack, manipulating him into killing his family. One of them actually stole a pack of matches and tried to burn it down. But I corrected them, sir. Corrected them? You said one of them stole a pack of matches, so why correct both of them? What did the other sister do? Are you seriously asking why a crazy person killed their entire family when it was only one of them that got into trouble? Besides, it's obvious Jeremy didn't grow up in a black household because when one of us got into trouble, the whole house was in trouble. I'm serious, if you weren't washing the entire house, your ass was next. Daddy? Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. There is no Danny, only Zool. Jeremy makes a pop culture ref. As Dick's flight lands, it behooves me to go back to the Miami newscast, where dude said, Travel in the Rockies is almost impossible. Ports are shut down, stranding thousands of passengers. So I'm wondering how Dick was still able to get a flight to Denver during the storms, which are still going strong. Because he said almost impossible. You know, the word that implies that it's still possible? Yep, this is scary as f but some of these typing mistakes are bull****. Why does he press the shift key when spelling that play in the middle? Why does he hit the space bar in the middle of typing makes on that same line? As a writer yourself, are you seriously questioning typos? Especially those from someone who is going crazy? 
Jesus Christ, how cold must it be out there? She's walking out wearing this. I know she thinks there's something wrong with the snowcat and she wants to check, but damn, get some warmer clothing on. If you're new to my channel and watching this video, it's at this point that I welcome you and point out that shit like this is why I created this series. Jeremy is legitimately asking for someone who is in a panic to put on warmer clothes just to check if her means of escape still works. That was something he thought was wrong with this movie. Yeah. Also, so what good does it do them? He wrote murder backwards on the door. So what? If The Shining was any good, Danny, Tony could have told her about Jack escaping the pantry and coming up here with an axe way before this. But instead, it's just giving some vague reference to murder that could be Danny just learning vocabulary words. I guess telling her what's really happening is too tough to write backwards in red lipstick, though. The word murder is written here on the door because this is where the murder of Wendy is supposed to occur. It's written backwards to symbolize that this will reverse what is supposed to happen here. In other words, Danny using his shine to get Dick to come to the Overlook reverses the murder of Wendy at this location. Here's Johnny! Taking Carson's name in vain. Sending one of the most iconic scenes in movie history. The fuck? Man, who cries for Dick Halloran in this movie? This guy is like the ultimate good guy. Can shine, definitely cares about the family, and is certainly going to save the day, right? He left Miami to come here, went through a whole bunch of to get to the hotel, and then mere minutes after showing up, Jack axes him. Story-wise, he ends up being pretty f***ing worthless. Although I guess he did drive a working snowcat up here, so his death isn't completely in vain. Story-wise, he's worthless? The band only explains the title of the film in one of the film's biggest concepts, and his death serves to save Wendy and Danny Torrance, and by extension, Aberstone in the future. But yeah, he's totally worthless. Jack's murder boner for Wendy suddenly wilted when Dick showed up, even though it's her he really hates. But now he can think of nothing other than killing Danny, even though the movie's shown him having little to no animosity towards his son this whole time. He is a very willful boy. It's his mother. She, uh, interferes. Yep, the film shows him having no animosity towards Danny the whole time. Right. Also, Jeremy says boner. This is where Stanley Kubrick's early attempt to make Eyes Wide Shut went terribly wrong. Also, what the f***? Is this supposed to be scary? How does this tie into the f***ed up going on at the Overlook? A ghost furry giving a ghost man a ghost blowjob isn't evil at all. It isn't evil, but to suggest that furries aren't scary? That's sinful as shit. Come and play with us, Daddy. No! Red rum, red rum. 